Welcome in to another edition of the KSO Show. I'm Mason Both, joined by Derek Young of K-State Online as we get you set for the Wildcats and Knights, the Big 12 opener in 2023. It is the first Big 12 game ever for UCF as a Big 12 member. Them, along with two other teams, will play their first Big 12 game today. One of those teams, uh, Houston, the fourth new member, they played theirs last week. They got stomped by TCU. And I think every team playing today or on Saturday uh, has the intention of doing the same thing that TCU did to Houston and saying, hey, this is still our conference. You've got a few years before you work your way into it. And uh, certainly K-State would like to do that with the opponent they have in UCF. Might be a little bit trickier given some different circumstances throughout the week. And just the fact that UCF is probably the best of the new four teams, at least from an overall program standpoint, being able to remain consistent. I mean, it's quite possible that BYU is the best of the four this year after what they did last week. They're on the road at Kansas. So it's a a big day for K-State and UCF on Saturday and it's time for us to get you prepared for all of that. And I guess the the best place to start, D.Y., is, uh, well, first and foremost, where this the quarterback conundrum sits for K-State right now because the Will Howard injury, it's going to be really the, the topic right up until game time. And it, this isn't like the game against, uh, what, o- Oklahoma State where it was, who will go? Will it be Adrian? Will it be Will Howard? That was an, what, that, was that an 11 a.m. kickoff or maybe 2.30? So it was – Earlier in the day, this is seven o'clock. People are going to be on pins and needles until seven o'clock waiting to see who takes the first snap uh, and then how the distribution goes on from there. And at the moment, I don't have any certainty on who it will be. Soon after Saturday's game, kind of watching Will Howard go through that game, seeing him afterwards with the media. It sure seemed to me that he was going to be questionable at best just because I knew that was probably going to that injury is going to tighten up on him a little bit more. And at the first few days of practice, we're probably going to be reaches for him in terms of being available for them. He probably needed treatment more than he did practice. That was confirmed by Coach Chris Kleiman on Tuesday, who called him questionable. And just with the track record and playbook that we've seen often from Kleiman, I thought it was reasonable to expect that maybe Avery Johnson will be the starter at that point just because of educated speculation and a reasonable assessment of the situation as well. So now we're a couple days from that. And and though we haven't, and when you're listening to it, we will have spoken to to offense coordinator Colin Klein. At this moment, I've kind of came back the other way too, just because I've, I've heard some things about Will Howard making some noticeable progress as well. Um, even if he's not 100%. So this is a, a a tough, you know, decision to gauge to handicap right now. Gun to my head, I might still say Avery plays more, but gun to my head, I can't tell you that Will Howard won't play. I think it's going to be, I mean, it's, it is a legit game time decision type of deal. It feels like right now. And it's probably going to be, very similar to, to how things play out, you know, to, to last year with, with Adrian and Will. And it's, hey, they're, you know, they're not going to know until probably late Friday night or, you know, maybe even uh, the day of on Saturday figuring stuff out. I, I think that if you're in the position where you feel like Will Howard can go out there and you're going to be able to prevent him from, you know, hurting himself further as you get ready to head into a bye week. So essentially you're going to have two full weeks to rest up if you're Will Howard before you play Oklahoma State, I think you play him because there is still, I mean, this team is a better team with Will Howard at quarterback right now than Avery Johnson. And that's not a a slight to Avery Johnson, who is obviously very talented. And honestly, this team needs Avery Johnson right now to be the best team that they can be because the run game has been pretty non-existent. And uh, the, the guy that was able to do a majority of it or make you feel better about it was Avery Johnson when he got his touches in Columbia last week. So I think, you know, bo- both guys probably should play if Will is healthy enough. I just still, you know, based off the, the context clues and, and what we've gotten throughout the week, I mean, I, I would have been dead set Tuesday after Chris Kleiman spoke and saying that it's only going to be Avery. We're not going to see Will on Saturday. Um, maybe it's changed a little bit. But I still feel like kind of with you, 
there might be a good chance that we see both of them, but Avery Johnson still gets the majority of the snaps or, you know, the, the breakdown is much closer to 50, 50 than what uh, one would probably imagine because you want to keep Will Howard healthy. And uh, you also are going to, you know, probably need him in some spots still because it's, it's beneficial to have a guy with his experience in the huddle and, you know, obviously his arm talent and everything that goes with it. I mean, one of the topics of conversation probably since Saturday afternoon was why did Will Howard not leave the field for Avery Johnson snaps on Saturday? And I don't know who threw it out there, probably a lot of people, but the the one that stood out to me that probably made the most sense is it probably was beneficial to have Will Howard's voice in the huddle and to have him be able to kind of help, I don't know, guide Avery Johnson and the rest of the team in that moment. Uh, I still don't necessarily agree with how Chris Kleiman and, and Colin Klein handled the, you know, the personnel on the field when Avery Johnson went out there, but that certainly makes some sense. And in a spot like this where it feels like you, you can't drop a second in a row uh, to, to you know, kind of kill momentum, I, I think that you do want as much Will Howard in this game as he's able to give, whether that's from the leadership side of it or certainly the uh, on-the-field physical side of it. Where I currently sit is that the only thing I'm certain of is that we'll see more Avery Johnson this week than we did last week. But I also know that Will Howard is doing everything he can to be available on Saturday, and they have yet to rule him out. Yeah, we'll just have to, to see how it goes and uh, where things roll on. All right, let's 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 roll on here then to uh, kind of the you know the, the next stop on our, our pregame preview, which is going to, to be looking at what what is going to work for K-State on Saturday against UCF. Because obviously there are things that stood out to people that did not work in the game against Missouri. So let's let's keep it positive to start off here. What What is K-State absolutely going to be able to do against UCF in your mind based off of what you know against the Knights, given very tough to gather anything because they've played – probably three pretty mediocre opponents and the, you know, the tight game with Boise on the road, Boise got smashed by Washington to start the season. So I'm not sure how much you, you really understand from that game either. Plus it's a totally different quarterback than the guy that played in Boise. Cause John Rice Plumley is out. Timmy McLean is in. I know UCF feels good about themselves, whether there's, they have, whether they should or not, we'll find out Saturday night, you know, what 10 30, p.m. central time mm -hmm. because right now we don't know anything about ucf whether they are underrated overrated if they beat kansas state on the road they're probably underrated because then they'll be four four no at that point yeah and, and they'll and they'll be in good shape and and kansas state won't at, at two and two but yeah it's hard to say what's going to work and what won't just because it's hard to gauge UCF. What I will say is UCF is probably better on defense than what you would blindly think. That's how I feel about the Knights at this point. Not that they're impenetrable or even better than Mizzou's defense. I don't think that they are. So what I will say is we probably don't know what's going to work and what won't. But the question that remains, can Kansas State get a traditional run game going? And I'm not sure. And I'm not going to blindly say that they can even against UCF, but maybe they get a boost with Christian Duffy back in the line. Yeah. I think one thing that, that stands out to me, and this is you know probably helpful in, in some categories, and honestly why you would probably want Will Howard in a game like this, is, I mean, UCF, for the, the level of competition they've played, Kent State and Villanova were not great opponents for them. I mean, Kent State, we talked about Nevada maybe being one of the worst you know, F FBS programs. I think Kent State is probably in that conversation too. Um, but I mean, through those three games, just just eight sacks for UCF. Now, you know, you think oh, that's still over two a game, but given who they've played and, and how they've accomplished things, I feel pretty good about K State being able to give whoever's time at quarterback. And so I I think this is the kind of game here where I mean Keegan Johnson, the 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 watch is still out there. Everybody's still waiting for something like that to happen, or at least some of the receivers to step up and go out and make a couple more plays for you. Because that was one of the things from the offense, in addition to the run game, that really has not been there all season, at least to what people would expect. But the receivers did not go out and make enough plays for K-State against Missouri. Now, some of that is opportunities to make those plays, but also – 
They just, you know, when they were there, they didn't go out and do anything about it. So I think if K-State has time to throw the ball against the Knights, um, that's something that they can probably capitalize on. And, you know, this is obviously as good of a time as any for those receivers to finally get going. And if you have time to get in the ball, then that's, that's going to be beneficial. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, facing the UCF secondary, which I think in past years has probably been where, uh, where UCF has probably been a little stronger on defense, but it, it's also tough to tell with UCF just because this is a totally different ball game for them. Like I've said, uh, for any of the teams moving up or anybody moving conferences in the last couple of years, at least, you know, especially at the group of five level, when you go up from, say, Conference USA to the American, then the American to the Big 12 or whatever it is, you're just going to have a totally different, like, way that things go for you scheduling wise and how it beats up on you and how it wears on you. So like, what, what is it like to face a, a nine game s- schedule against the big 12 and how does your talent stack up against the big 12 as opposed to sure, it can be really good in the American or it can be really good in conference USA, wherever you're coming from, but how does it look against the big 12? And that's probably something that I have a question on UCF for. I mean, that's, that's going to be the same logic that I use when, when we're in basketball season and we're, we're talking about what's Houston going to be like in this league. I think Houston's going to be really good in, in basketball still. No no questions about that. But I don't think they're going to be as dominant or perceived as, as good as they were when they're in the American because playing 18 games in the Big 12 is much different than the 18 or 20 games that they play in the American Athletic Conference. Like It's just a totally different thing. So for UCF, I kind of view it that way, and I think K-State – the opportunity is there for them to maybe go out there and, and test and challenge UCF. And honestly, it's probably less about challenging UCF and it's more about for K-State getting right at a spot that they desperately need people to stand up at. Yeah, and for UCF, that argument is definitely valid, although they'll probably, using it from that standpoint, when you play Power 5 opponent after Power 5 opponent like you're alluding to, it can be daunting, but guess what? It also means they're probably more effective earlier rather than later, and you're yeah. probably getting them at the wrong time too. For Kansas State, this game is very valuable. If you want to peek ahead and say bye week afterwards, get people healthy, play a pretty underwhelming Oklahoma State team on the road in a game that looks pretty gettable, and, and what do you know, Missouri – Losses, you know, in the rearview mirror at that point, a distant memory, and you've started two and zero in the Big Twelve. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see where where do you stand on what you think K State can accomplish with DJ Giddens and the running game this this week? I don't uh, because, know because yeah, I mean, I, it's going to be helpful. We think that Christian Duffy is back in some capacity, but I mean, the, the, that's a big deal. That's probably the great unknown with K State right now. I think you know we've talked about the defense and some of the struggles they've had earlier in the year. And if those play out a little bit differently than what we might anticipate right now, the season can still go in a really positive spot. I think offensively, the great unknown is if the, if the run game with running back starts to work better for K-State um, kind of where the ceiling shifts back to and, and what the thoughts on they can be are, but it, you know, not having Trayshawn Ward is certainly a, a thing that they'll have to deal with this week. Uh, Chris Kleiman called him doubtful earlier in the week, so we're expecting a heavy dose of DJ Giddens, who's a capable back, but does he have the blocking in front of him, and is K-State going to be able to establish the run? I'll say this. If they establish the run, the traditional run game and do it that way, um, add in the other elements that probably open up because of that, they'll win. If they run the ball, they'll win. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know that they can. Yeah. it's. I mean – how long How long do you think we'll be asking the question about are they going to be able to run the ball before we give up and just say they can't run the ball this year because of the offensive line? Well, I wouldn't rule out that they can on Saturday night, but they, they might have to. Let's see what the weather looks like too yeah. because uh, uh, that could play a factor as we're sitting here on you know recording this on Thursday afternoon and we're not sure if it's going to be that dry. Um, wet field, we'll see what happens. Avery Johnson might help the run game as well because – if he plays more, if they're doing some of that read option stuff, guess what? They might key in on Johnson and the gives in those situations uh, open up a lot more as well. So we'll see Christian Duffy coming back as well. There are some signs there that you can point to 
that, hey, maybe Kansas State will run the ball better this week. And you're at home. You always play better at home, you would think. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I think that's a, a significant deal. All right. Uh, what concern – I mean, we've talked about concerns and, and what we think might work for the K-State offense. Defensively, um, where where does UCF maybe concern you on what they bring to the table? Obviously, it's kind of an unknown with, with Timmy McLean at quarterback, uh, but, you know, this, this is still a, a good UCF team and a guy that put up really good numbers last week against an inferior opponent. The creativity and deception that uh, – and interesting wrinkles that Gus Malzahn always has with his offense. They're a, a tough – crew to prepare for just from a schematic standpoint because of how complex and attacking that he is on the offensive side. He's a good offensive mind um, doing it with a backup quarterback, but you have this complexity, this deception, and this creativity going against the team that's even more inexperienced on the defensive side of the ball now. Yeah. I mean, I, it's going to be, it's going to be fascinating to watch. I mean, it's, you think about last year, the team in the Big 12 that's probably most like that with how complex they can be offensively is KU. And the KU offense was able to to do some damage to a good K-State defense last year. Yeah, and the fact that this is probably a more run-based attack in that way, though, I, I actually might liken it more to like the, the Kendall Bryles, Jeff Levy style too. So mm -hmm. maybe Oklahoma is a better uh, comparison as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think that's a, a good call. I mean, this is, this is what there is to note about Timmy McLean, who's playing quarterback for UCF this week. I mean, last week he ran for 65 yards on 11 carries. So they, they will use him in the run game, despite the fact that he surprisingly didn't have much success running the ball at USF. But I think a lot of that had to do with, you know, South Florida not being that great as the, as the UCF fans have told me on, on the YouTube comments already that uh, he played on a bad USF team that was not his fault, and I'm supposed to bow down to Timmy McLean already. Well, uh, it could be true. It could be true. The Bulls were pretty pathetic uh, <laughs> during that time frame, but at this at the same time, UCF also has two running backs, I believe, that average over six yards per carry. Also, something to note: this is a team that's had a lot of success running the balls so far. Kent State really good run defense. So if you take that away, make McLean beat you. What's it look like? What I will say, though, is McLean can also run the ball just like Plumley, Not as well, but he is a running threat. And I thought Brady Cook had some instant success on the ground last week. Yeah, well, Missouri, Missouri was good with that early. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, you at, you at, one point, at one point, you look in that game probably late third quarter and like, man, I, I thought they were doing much more on the ground running the quarterback. But that was all really early. And then, yeah, Brady Cook gets banged up at some point, and it, it all kind of disappears there. Um, and fortunately, though, Missouri had the wideouts or the wideout to expose K-State's biggest weakness, which is their secondary. UCF does not have a receiver like Luther Burden. Um, that, that I am confident in saying, no matter how good UCF might think their receiving core is, um, which in past years has been fine. So I, I think that this is probably, if, if UCF is going to try and run it, you feel really good about K-State's chances. It's just a matter of, like a lot of things, like how disciplined can you stay if there are some exotic things going on with the UCF offense? Because, you know, it, it probably isn't fair of me to do this, but it's been five years now. Uh, there are a lot of instances since Chris Kleiman came to K-State where his defenses have gotten burnt by stuff like that, where – uh, you move a couple guys around, you give them a little something unique or exotic, and a big play can pop. Or you know they've been burnt by some trick plays a handful of times. Um, I, I don't know that UCF is going to have to get that gimmicky in the game, but it is one of those things that that K State can be susceptible to. And they'll be willing to do it. But at the end of the day, if you're Kansas State, uh, just as you have through three through three weeks, take away the running game for UCF, and if make Timmy McLean beat you. And if a backup quarterback comes into Bill Snyder Family Stadium and beats you, yeah, yeah, I guess you throw up your hands and say WTF. Yeah, uh, it's probably the best thing to do there. All right. Uh, one guy in particular on the defense to talk about this was in our over-unders this week. Uh, you can go find those on K-State Online currently. Uh, Kobe Savage, the, the number was five and a half tackles. I think we all took the over. You know, the first two weeks, it was a little shaky with, with how he looked. I think he looked like – a player much similar to the guy we saw last season on Saturday in Columbia. I thought that was easily his best game of the year. 
He made he made plays and an impact at times where you noticed him, and he also didn't have any moments where you, you thought to yourself, oh, he, he's hurting him here, or he doesn't look 100%. I, I'm not sure he still is 100%, but he's obviously moving in the right direction, and getting a couple games under his belt uh, certainly has helped his process. So w- what do you make of Kobe Savage and what he can be the rest of the season for K-State? Agree on all that. Um, probably don't need to add a, too much commentary on top of it. Had his best game, heading in the right direction. Needs to be more of a leader now, even more of a captain without Daniel Green in the middle of the defense. So he's got more responsibility in that capacity, but they have to get the other safeties right. And that maybe that falls on his shoulders as well. But VJ Payne, Mar- Marquis Siegel, got to step up their game. Um, part of the problem so far. Yeah, um, it's going to be uh, going to be fun to watch, fun to kind of observe and see how he helps out with. I mean, I don't know. They they're going to need to, to communicate very well because we have seen uh, you know some examples where if this defense can't get the communication thing down, it can have some serious breakdowns. I mean, obviously. It's what happened between Siegel and Parrish on the, the first burden touchdown against Missouri. There were some other moments in that game where you kind of thought mm, they're not on the same page. And I always harken back to the, the to the game against Texas last year. It took the defense a long time in that game to figure out how to play without Julius Brents on the field. Um, I mean, you lose your best player, the guy that's probably the most experienced, good leader in everything. It was a tough blow that took them a long time to figure it out. And honestly, they you know, were probably helped out by the fact that uh, the game was put into to Quinn Ewer's hands a little bit more uh, later on because the more Texas threw, the worse they were off. You know, you give Bijan the ball and then let a couple throws go, you can get beat pretty good. So I, I guess that's the one thing that uh, I think Kobe Savage is m- more than what he can do on the field with his actual you know physical traits. I think it's going to have to come down to, to his his vocal and mental side of it that is impactful for K State this year because they're they're getting younger on the defense as we speak with every injury that occurs or whatever else happens. This is it's going to be a very young and inexperienced defense for most of the year. You'd hope that they at least can play well at home with less communication problems. Yeah, we'll see how it uh, all works out there. All right. Uh, let's move on here now, and real quick before we we de- determine anything later in the show and finish things off with our prediction, who who has to step up and be the game MVP for K State this week on offense and defense uh, for them to come out with the win? On offense, heck, if they, if, I haven't even thought about much about this. If the offensive line plays well, I think Kansas State plays is in a good shape. Now the defense probably worries more. Worries me more than the offense, but if they can put their game on the offensive line, I like their chances. Cooper BB back to left guard. Um, so if Christian Duffy coming back to right tackle really makes a difference, then then I like their chances. You don't even know who what quarterback's going to play. Ben Sitter just scored two touchdowns last week. They do need a receiver to pop, I will say that. So picking a receiver here is probably not a terrible idea. Um, right tackle Christian Duffy back. I go back and forth. I want to just say offensive line, but it's cheating a little bit. I think, uh, I think that's fair though. I mean, but uh, you... if I go one guy, how about this DJ Giddens? How about that? Yeah, I think that's probably the good play because I mean that's that's picking the individual that is going to benefit from the offensive line playing well. Um, I mean, I, I'm with you on where you're coming from. If the offensive line plays well on Saturday, I don't think K State has to to freak out too much. I mean. Especially the game's wet, yeah. Yeah, no no matter who the quarterback is, if the offensive line plays well for K-State, I think they can win about any game this year. Um, the problem has been that the offensive line has not played well, and fortunately their non-con consists of two not very good teams, or at least not up to the snuff of K-State. And then they went on the road, and they faced the team that had the talent up front, has the athletes in other areas to match or surpass k-state and that's why missouri was able to win in addition to some other things Um, but it it was clear that the offense was probably more so to blame than the defense ultimately on saturday in columbia and i think a lot of that still goes to the the offensive line even though some guys were probably a little bit better and and better in like the pass protection um will howard was hobbled and then also they just you can tell that the coaching staff didn't trust the offensive line for them to run the ball enough traditionally uh, on Saturday. So if they can do that, you're in good shape. I guess 
the way I'll go, because I, you know, DJ Ginn's probably would have been on my list, and I would have assumed that. Well, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll throw out I'll throw out Avery Johnson only because we know that one way or the other he's going to have an expanded role in this game. He is going to play more than he did against Missouri, whether Will Howard is a go or not, and he's the quarterback that we know for sure will get reps in this game. We're, we're still iffy on what Will Howard looks like. And I just think given the circumstances of how this offense has looked, um, they may still be able to throw the ball with some success, you know, with, with Will Howard if he's in there. But it's going to come down to what can Avery Johnson's legs do for this offense right now because I'm just I, – I can't put full faith into the offensive line to have it figured out and assume that D.J. Giddens is going to come through. And so I think that all these all these reps and snaps for Johnson are going to be because of the fact that they need him to run the ball – and so you need a couple big run plays, and maybe he breaks a couple loose. So uh, I'll, I'll go Avery Johnson offensively. On the defensive side of the ball, um, I mean, I don't know if I don't know if he needs to be an MVP, um, but certainly you could pick about any linebacker you wanted in this game and say that they need to step up and fill the void of Daniel Green, especially if you know UCF is going to to do a lot with the run game or try and get the quarterbacks involved. There's going to need to be a lot of discipline there and just a, a lot of awareness on the field that it's going to be interesting to see if they can do with, you know, Austin Romaine, a, a true freshman starting. And then, you know, it, we'll probably see Asa Newsom some in the game, rotating in and out on one of the outside spots. And uh, Toby Austin Somni will get in there. He's a young guy. Bo Palmer is going to get a lot of run, Chris Kleiman said. He's a junior, but it's not like he's played a ton to have great experience for probably what's coming his way. So, I know I'll I'll cop out a little bit and say the linebackers, uh, but probably at you know if you wanted to pick a guy, you'll just go Austin Romaine because he's taking the spot of Daniel Green, and he I mean he's been good through three games. He's been noticeable as a true freshman on the field. So I'll say Austin Romaine. With the linebackers a little bit shorthanded and inexperienced, with a secondary having a problem with inexperience themselves uh, with miscommunication and, and a lack of eye discipline and going up against the team that throws a lot of eye candy at you, you know, I'll, I'll take a different route and say that makes the pass rush in this game probably a little bit more important. It makes the defensive line even more important and critical because they need to uplift their game to help out those other two spots. Best pass rusher on the team is Khalid Duke. I feel like I, I go this route pretty often, but, uh, if he has one of those games that defense events sometimes happen, and he has the capability to, mm -hmm. capability to do this, like he had against like, Texas Tech last yeah. year, yeah, there, there's games where guys are just unblockable. Defense events, like there's games where mm -hmm. defense events of his caliber just have games where they can single handedly take over. Um, if there was ever a time for him to do it this year, there will probably be another time to do it. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but this one screams loudly. Um, at the moment. Well, I, I'm with you. You know that one of the things that I've been very, you know, I don't know, I'm not high on it, but I, I've been on the trail of and, and banging the drum for is K-State needs to get more pressure early in the game. I mean, I think in, in all three games, eventually it's come along and um, what K-State's top 15 in sacks right now in the country just doesn't feel that way because teams early on in games haven't dealt with a ton of K-State pressure. I, I went through and and looked at, at the, the pressure numbers in terms of sacks and tackles for loss for K-State. In the first three games of the year, they have two sacks and then seven tackles for loss in the first in all three first quarters. Now, two of those sacks and four of the tackles for loss came in the SEMO game. So that is in the last two games against FBS opponents. K-State has just three tackles for loss and no sacks in the first quarter. And you think about, I mean, you don't necessarily need tackles for loss for this, but K-State had Missouri at a th on a third down at midfield in Columbia on Missouri's first drive of the game. If they would have been able to stop them there, they probably would have had maybe a different tune in that game and they can change some things early. I just think it's important for this team to get pressure. And honestly, one thing that, that has gone on here is, uh, UCF has been really good about protecting early in the game. They only, they've only given up one sack in the first quarter all season, and uh, in total they only have given up four tackles for loss in the first quarter. So UCF has been pretty good about it, but if you can get to them, 
I think that's huge. And, you know, Khalid Duke plays a large role in that. And I ha- I'm high on Brendan Mott and what he can do. And I think also you know, going back to the over and unders that we did this week, but one of the numbers was two and a half turnovers in the game. I took the under and I said in it that, you know, I- I'm confident K-State throws at least one interception in this game, maybe two. But I still don't think we go over that number. Now, maybe if it's wet, it changes with fumbles. But I don't have much confidence in the secondary to force interceptions right now. So that means if K-State's going to to get a pick on Saturday, it has to come from the pressure that's coming off of the defensive line. So uh, I'm with you. Those guys need to have a big day, and Khalid Duke is the most talented of them. So it probably falls on his shoulders. What I will say is I think that number of turnovers is easily over just because we're talking about potentially a very (laughs) wet game with two backup quarterbacks. I think that's a recipe for disaster or at least a pretty sloppy game or at least uh, some miscues that can contribute to that. Uh, So I differ in that department. What I also will say is Kansas State's been really good on third down, uh, third down defense, especially against Missouri so far this season. The not so what hurt them. They didn't limited, get to third down. Yeah, they didn't get to third down enough. Got to limit explosive plays, too. So if, if we're going to talk about a key or a factor, I mean, I can't say limits explosive plays as a defense, although explosive plays are can sometimes be a symptom of you know that inexperience that we talked about that now exists on two different levels of the defense. But if they can do that, and maybe it's a little bit easier to do so at home, then you feel a little bit better about where they are. All right, let's roll on. Time for uh, best bets. Look at uh, a couple of the things that, that stand out to us that uh, are some of the the best bets of the week around college football for DY and I. Uh, last week, both of us went one and two. I said I was going to start keeping track of them. Uh, I did. It was not like the, the the best of things. The one that hit for you was Ben Sennett touchdown. Uh, he, he got two of them. Um, so that, you know, could have been a little bit bolder and said, oh, he gets two. And then the one that hit for me was uh, Washington just killed Michigan State. Uh, which makes all the sense in the world. And honestly, you know, if you're you're looking at uh, like parallels, what Washington did to Michigan State is probably what the Chiefs do to the Bears on on Sunday. Uh, the Bears also with a lot of dysfunction going on this week, and the Chiefs looking to get right with a with a big offensive performance. So uh, that's uh, you didn't even have to ask for for an NFL one, but I just sneak into that in there because I was going to say is one parallel. of your best bets the Chiefs. That's one no, of no, 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 not this week. Uh, no, mine this week very very West Coast heavy, a uh, little Pac-12 <laughs> flair with mine. Or honestly, uh, it. I guess technically Big Ten and uh, Pac-2 flair. But uh, here here are the best bets for the week, what uh, D.Y. and I have put together. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see them on your screen. If you're listening only, we will read through them here. Uh, I'll let D.Y. explain his first one here. He's got UConn plus 21.5 against Duke this week. Uh, UConn's the home team. So in general, that's a tricky road game because you wouldn't think that if you're Duke – that you have to subject yourself to a road trip to stores in general, but add on to the fact that Duke's had a fast start to the season, maybe due for a lull, and they play Notre Dame next week. And if they're undefeated and playing and playing Notre Dame, I think that's an easy game to overlook and look forward to in terms of playing the Fighting Irish next week. Um, UConn is a good coach. I think I think that's gettable. All right, uh, my first one. I've got USC minus thirty four and a half at Arizona State. Uh, Arizona State, they flat suck. Uh, <laughs> it's not good for them right now. Uh, if if Oklahoma State is beating you by two touchdowns in your own building, you've got legit problems. Uh, USC is probably going to do some pretty nasty things to the Sun Devils this weekend. And I know USC's defense is not very good, and maybe it's a, a little better this year. Arizona State just is nowhere close to good enough to uh, actually make that matter. So USC minus 34 and a half is an easy one for me. I don't mind it. Yeah, the Sun Devils get shut out by Fresno State last yeah. week. Fresno State, pretty good group of five team, we'll mm-hmm. say. Pretty good. Um, USC, one less media member covering the Trojans this week. <laughs> might might make the difference as well. It might be in your favor. Well, it lightens the load. Uh, not as much pressure on the guys. They won't be grilled as hard after the game. All right, uh, your second one of the week, Florida State minus two and a half at Clemson. Uh, you like the, the Seminoles this week, despite – what they they only won by two against Boston College last weekend, right? Yeah, but that was Jordan Travis, I think, missing a quarter and a half of football, maybe looking ahead to this matchup with Clemson, a big rivalry game. I actually got this at Florida State minus two. 
<laughs> excuse me, we can we can agree that Clemson is probably going to play up a level t- this weekend when they're hosting Florida State in our tribal game at home, raucous atmosphere. But I think we can also say that Florida State is much, much better than two yeah. points better than Clemson. Yeah, I, I don't know that this Clemson team is very good, and I ha- I didn't think last year's was very good. All right, uh, my second one, Oregon State minus two and a half at Washington State. Okay. Both teams are ranked. Oregon State is the, the legit good team here. Washington State is the team that is three and zero, and they got to beat a Big Ten team that is you know first year with a new coach is traditionally good, but is not good this year. And I'm talking about Washington State's win over Wisconsin, so I've got the Beavers minus two and a half on the road uh, in Pullman this weekend. And I like that bet because I do think Oregon State's a legitimate team, probably could win the Pac-12 this year, yeah. and Washington State's probably fake good where it wouldn't surprise me if the season goes on, they're struggling to make a bowl. Like like that that kind of slippage I would anticipate perhaps being the case in Pullman. Before I get to my last Kansas State bet, I did have a few others that because we're only taking three. We want one of them to be yeah. Kansas State. Yeah. Memphis first half plus three and a half against Missouri. Look, Missouri just had their Super Bowl. Uh, they're, you know, they're partying and everything. I think this is an ultimate letdown spot for Missouri especially since they have to play it in a neutral site. <laughs> Memphis not a terrible team. I think this is a good good option and a good spot to fade Missouri. Also, I think it's a good spot to fade Wyoming. They're playing at home, but it's against Appalachian State, who's a pretty good program. Wyoming just got wore out by playing and competing with Texas for three quarters. Already has a big, big win over Texas Tech. It might be hard to get up to play a group of five team, even one that is good because you just thought you competed for eight quarters, essentially, against the Red Raiders and Longhorns. The the spread is two and a half. I would take that for Appalachian State, a two and a half point dog, but I think they went out right. I think, I mean, I think that's a, a good call there because that's that's like the too big for your britches game if you're Wyoming, where they're probably feeling really good about themselves right now. And like, man, look at us. We we're competing with the Big 12. We could, we're could we going to win the Mountain West easy, whatever. You get this non-con game with App State in. Uh, I think that's probably a pretty good call. And I mean, App State, they, they've blown out two teams, and then their only loss is a tight one that they easily could have beaten North Carolina, who is obviously a, a talented team. Yeah, and, and you could say this might be a letdown spot for App State, too. Now you have to go on the road to play Wyoming after being right there to win the game against North Carolina. But this is nothing new for that program. They've yeah. contended in games like this for years. This is a little bit newer for Wyoming. Uh, this will be Appalachian State's first game against a team not from the state of North Carolina this season. Just little little analytics there for anybody that's uh, but, but curious. App State, a mountain team, so maybe the elevation doesn't True. affect them. Will not bother them. Uh, Wyoming loses home field advantage for that reason. All right, last uh, bets, best bets of the week. These are our K-State picks. D.Y. going with the first quarter over in the game of 12 and a half points. And uh, I'm taking the golden boy, Avery Johnson, for a touchdown. Uh, I mean, he's going to play in this game. They need him for the run game. And if he play, if you know, he has to play more because Will Howard doesn't go, that's an easy one. Uh, I still think in any circumstance, Avery Johnson probably finds the end zone this week. Heck, Avery Johnson, two touchdown might be uh, more appealing mm. just because the odds for one might not be what you want. True. Um, so we'll see what those are out yet. And I like the first quarter over 12 and a half because Kansas State has scored on their first possession all three games. They could do that again. And mm-hmm. I'm just – not too confident in that defense, but even if not, it wouldn't spite me. Can't say it gets too touch on the first quarter. So I think that first quarter number total is a little bit low because I could see a fast start of points and then slowly dissipate, much like we saw last week in Columbia. Well, and you think if K State can't run the ball like they want to, that the you know the amount of plays and the way the clock is going to run, it's not going to impact it uh, like it the clock new clock rules have in a lot of other games this year uh, around college football. All right. Moving on, time to take a look at the Big 12 scoreboard. Uh, essentially, the first full week of games in the Big 12. Two teams will not play Big 12 games. That will be Houston and TCU, but they started conference play against each other last week. So TCU alone in first place all over again in the Big 12 uh, as it stands right now. 
they will uh, get to uh, take a hiatus this week. They're at home against SMU as they battle for the Iron Skillet one last time because that's another rivalry going by the wayside with realignment and everything else going on. TCU uh, doesn't seem interested in, in continuing that, at least for the time being. So if you're watching on, on YouTube, you can see up on your screen a look at all the Big 12 games this weekend. The first two at 11, Oklahoma at Cincinnati. Cincinnati's first game in the Big 12. The Sooners on the road at Nippert. And then SMU TCU, as, as mentioned. And then three afternoon games with BYU at KU, Texas Tech at West Virginia, Oklahoma State at Iowa State. And then three night games, Sam Houston State at Houston, Texas at Baylor, and then UCF at K-State. Uh, which of those games stands out to you, D.Y.? First, I have a question. Like the the TCU not wanting to continue the series with SMU, like it's not like they were in the they were conference. Yeah, yeah. Now they're not, so I don't necessarily. The logic for not it. continuing it was a little was a little shaky by the TCU people that I saw that were trying to to argue is it why just because it you want some is it because you want some variation in your Power Five conference opponent? I guess. Yeah, I'm I'm not really sure. Uh, they just said it's going to be put on pause after next year's game. Uh, SMU SMU's in a better league now, so we don't want to <laughs> play them. Yeah, exactly. I mean that that, that probably could have something to do with it. Uh, I, this is this is what uh, w- was said uh, by by the uh, TCU side of things. Their athletic director Jeremiah Donati said, "We have a tremendous respect for SMU and the Battle of the Iron Skillet, which dates back over hundreds of years." Playing more home games has been a priority for us and our fans and is most importantly in the best interest of the TCU football program. We look forward to annually having seven home games and as many as eight in certain years as our future non-conference schedules evolve. We keep open the possibility of future games with the Mustangs. So basically, it seems like they're doing this in a way to guarantee themselves more home games and whatever else. It made it else, seem but... like they were going to do it no matter what. Yeah. Well, what? Why can't you just say, "Hey, we're gonna play SMU every year"? They're they're now our new, you know, Power Five team. We play every year, whatever. Um, I don't know. It's it, it seems like TCU might just be dodging them and deciding it's it's not worth it to play SMU anymore. Yeah, I would think it'd be more dangerous for them when SMU was a Group of Five team. Yeah. Um, anyway, hey, I'll uh, back to the Big Twelve scoreboard. Let's touch on some of these games now. I will pose you the same question that John Kurtz posed to Cole and I on the okay. three ball post-game podcast, and I don't know if you've heard it yet, but he says, your life is on the line. So um, it's a great, great beginning start here. Okay. You, you might die. To save yourself, you have to pick an offense to score. Are you taking the Oklahoma State one or the Iowa State one? Oof. You want to know my logic here? I Look, one, my first logic John wouldn't accept. It was that I'm probably going to fail anyway, so I'll take the offense – that has a better defense to save them, and that's Iowa State. Yeah. He said that doesn't count, even though he took Oklahoma State because their head coach is Gundy. I was like, well, why does that count? <laughs> anyway, um, so I said, I will pick the pick the team we know has one bad quarterback because we know Oklahoma State has three bad quarterbacks. Yeah, that's uh, – man, that is a tough question. Um, I mean, if this was like if – a ga- if a game was not actually being played and it's just like, hey, I'm setting both teams, they get the ball – at the 25 yard line at their own 25 and who's going 75 yards first to score on the defense they're facing i would probably go with oklahoma state but because a game is actually going to be played i think i side with your logic that uh the iowa state offense i would maybe trust because the defense might put them in a position to score like you know an interception and they they have the ball at like the two yard line instantly and you just got to punch through for two yards um i'm fascinated by how this game plays out though like this is easily my favorite game of the week i i cannot wait to see how this plays out it is going to be so so bad that it's fun uh because both of these teams i mean through three weeks we know they suck now there's no question about it they are terrible they are some of the worst i actually i put oklahoma state as my worst team in our, our big 12 power rankings this week that's how uh you know poor i think they've played this season and um, yeah, I, I, for some reason though, I still think Oklahoma State wins this game just because I, it's weird to see Oklahoma State this bad. And when you have a bad Iowa State team in front of me, I'm going to say that Mike Gundy is able to beat them, uh, even though I'm not confident in that at all. 
I think Oklahoma State probably does still have the coaching advantage, and maybe that matters here. But Iowa State is the home team. Jack Trey Stadium with the crowd behind him has a much better defense. Oklahoma State's defense is not great either. Yeah, true. <laughs> and so I'll take the Cyclones. Uh, but I'm not going to pick anyone to cover because the margins are going to be so yeah. small in a low-scoring game. Yeah, it's it's not going to be very pretty. Uh, other Big 12 games of note. I think Texas Tech at West Virginia is a fascinating one just from a uh, standpoint. You know, you know, you said the most fascinating one for you is at least most fun to watch for you is Oklahoma State, Iowa State. <laughs> yeah. My, mine's BYU, Kansas. I don't know yeah. what's going to happen there, but I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, look, KU's performance last week is a little bit of a head scratcher because yeah. they should have killed Nevada. Um, no matter you know how much I still think that the KU defense struggles a little bit, they should have probably taken them down with more ease and, and not had it be a seven-point game. But it shows that the KU defense is still a, a major weak spot. And the offense is great, but also at times like you're relying on some guys that, that can't necessarily keep up. Like Jalen Daniels and Devin Neal are great, um, but around them it's probably still pretty similar to what KU has had in the past. And honestly, if you're looking at this KU team compared to ones over the last five or six years, there's probably less skill position talent at receiver than what they've had on other teams. And I, you know sometimes when Jalen Daniels throws the ball, it's, it's like he's just throwing it far and crossing his fingers um i mean and this is one of those games where byu could prove that even you know, after last week they've earned a lot of respect but they could get a little bit more if they rolled into lawrence and, and were competitive and, and won that game because at the start of the year this was a game that i was given to ku easy like i thought byu was going to be like a four win team this season yeah now i will say that the spread's kind of big bigger than i thought it would be it's like a 10 point yeah kansas is the favorite at 10 points so um, stinky to the point where stinky enough, I think you might even cover now because 10 just seems wild to, to, for it to be there. Yeah. Two other weird things this week, maybe funny things that I'm just trying to find a little bit of, um, entertainment. Houston's playing Sam Houston. Houston's already lost a race. I'm going to assume Sam Houston's also in the city of Houston. So if Houston loses this, I don't think they will, but it's probably on the table the way they're playing. If they lose this, are they the third worst? Are they the third best team in their city? Uh, I, I think they would be if <laughs> Sam Houston was in Houston. It's like a suburb north. It's in Huntsville, so I guess okay. technically it's like Houston. We'll give okay. it to them. Okay. They're in their uh, in their you know immediate area. They are probably the worst. Uh, and, it's bad. Well, they should. <laughs> it's bad. And then. I've mentioned this to you already, so this won't surprise you. West Virginia, pretty yep. good start, right? You beat you beat Pitt. Your other one is against Duquesne. So West Virginia has only beaten teams this year from the city of Pittsburgh. There you go. I mean, we've got a couple of those like that. You know, Houston's <laughs> playing their their second opponent from their their own backyard, and West Virginia's only beaten teams from there. And App State, this is their first time in three in their fourth game playing a team not in the state of North Carolina. That game's just fascinating to me because West Virginia has surprised me a little bit to start. They've played a little bit better, even their Penn State game. Then I, I didn't think they got killed as bad as I thought they might. Um, th I mean, this is one of those that if West Virginia wins, maybe we have to change a little bit how we think about them. Although th I think there's a chance that Garrett Green doesn't go. And if Texas Tech were to lose this game, the sky is falling in Lubbock. I mean, this goes from a highly anticipated season to, man, this flat sucks. Um, so I'm going to be fascinated to see how that one plays out. Um, honestly, though, I, you're right. BYU-KU is easily the best game of the week in the Big I 12. Think that, yeah, probably. I will say the two teams with the most pressure on them, because you brought up a good point, Texas Tech, because you're playing a little bit of a tricky game against West Virginia and Morgantown. If you lose, you're one mm -hmm. and three, I believe, in what was supposed to be a season where you contend for a Big 12 yeah. title. Not that you still can't. But boy, that's that's – that's a rough start in Kansas State, quite honestly, because you yep. were also supposed to contend for a Big 12 title. It lost to UCF at home, which is realistic, but you had two and two, and you don't feel good about yourself either. So the, the two teams from that standpoint that probably the most pressure on them is Texas Tech and Kansas State. Just one, my one last observation of any Big 12 game, it's still uh, we probably probably haven't discussed, Texas Baylor, mm -hmm. gut, gut instinct on that game, Texas probably waxes the Bears in Waco. Yeah, I think Baylor sucks. Uh, 
I, you know, anybody that's listened has known that all season. I think Dave Aranda is a fraud. Uh, it was wild. I was, I was running some errands this morning and, uh, listening to the, the I was going to say the great sports talk in Wichita. I was listening to the sports talk in Wichita and, uh, there was a, there was a show on that I was listening to. It was after, it was after 9 a.m. So it was not, it was not my old show for anybody that was thinking I was going down that route. It's not my old show. Um, but anyways, I was listening and they start talking about Texas's schedule. And one of the guys is talking about like games they might slip up. And he's like, well, yeah, that game with Texas Tech and then the, you know, the road trip to Baylor. And it's the same guy that a couple months ago had a bunch of great things to say about Baylor. And I'm like, what, what is this dude talking about? Like, how can you be high on Baylor? I, I texted a guy and I said, Hey, does he realize that like RG three and art Bryles aren't there anymore? Like this team is not good. And I I'm with you. I think Texas just smothers Baylor. Uh, it, 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 this is this is not good for them. And I honestly think Dave Aranda, little- if Baylor was wise, Dave Aranda has gone after this year. Cause I, I think it was a little bit of fool's gold, the Big 12 title they won because he had a bunch of great staffers, including Joey McGuire. A little bit of a get-right game for Texas, too, after kind of being underwhelming last week against Wyoming. Yeah, and they got to prove to all of us that uh, their win against Alabama was still worth something now that we're all trying to discount it. All right, uh, we, 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 sh- we showed it right there. K-State, UCF, you said the Cats are probably the team next to Texas Tech that has the most to prove this weekend. They are at home, 7 o'clock, Saturday night, FS1 against UCF. Uh, let's go over Ooh. this and take a look at uh, how, how things play out and, and who gets the win. Look, I'm only going to take Kansas State because they are the home team and UCF is playing with a backup quarterback on the road because there's a lot of reasons not to really like Kansas State this week, to be quite honest. Inexperience in a secondary kind of cost them last week. Now you have an experience at linebacker as well against a team that has run the ball very well so far this season. You have an offensive line that hasn't gotten completely right yet if you're Kansas State. You have a receiver group that wasn't the best last week and hasn't been particularly sharp. You're injured at quarterback. You're shorthanded at running back. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could point to and say, this is a troublesome situation for the Wildcats. But UCF is playing on the road with their backup quarterback. and. For that reason, I will take the Wildcats still by one point, 28-27. Okay. A real tidy. I mean, I think it's going to be close. I think K-State, I'm taking them 27-23 uh, in this game. That will be my my pick. I just – I it, it really comes down to the offensive line. If the offensive line plays well, like you said earlier, K-State's going to win this game. and They can do so many things if the offensive line is set and ready to go. Um, and, and this is a game that you have to have if you're K-State and you you want to try and still accomplish everything that you kind of thought was possible this year. And just, you know, in all honesty, to get people back on the wagon because uh, I, there are a lot of people that are really, really down after what took place last week in Columbia. Um, and I'm sure, you know, some people inside of the building also that way as well. You You need this for a lot of reasons. And also, it would really suck to go into your bye week with two straight losses and, and games that were easily winnable that you probably should have come out on top of. So, I mean, K-State's going to have to work hard for it. It does not feel like this is a game that's going to come easy for them. UCF, first Big 12 game ever. They've got a lot to prove in, in the we belong type of circumstance. Um, but I, I do think K-State edges out UCF, and we'll just have to see how it, it ultimately plays out because, honestly, this is a game with all the different factors in it, like we've talked about, you know, backup quarterbacks being the talk, maybe some weather. There's really no good way to know how the the scripting of this game is going to, to go out. Like, are, are there going to be a lot of points early? Is it going to be a, a slugfest? How, how sloppy is it? We'll see. I'm hoping there's a lot of points early. Yeah, me too. Me too for your sake on that one. All right, that will do it for DY and I and this edition of the KSO Show. A reminder that we will be going with uh, some video after the game on Saturday, win or lose for the Cats. You can get our instant reaction to K-State and UCF over on the K-State Online YouTube page. And then Sunday, sometime late morning, early afternoon, the KSO Sunday Show with myself, Drew Galloway, and KSU underscore fan will be live where we give our reaction and notes from the Wildcats game with UCF. And then D.Y. and I back here on Monday for the storylines of the week and recapping our over-unders. 
A lot of things to still do before kickoff at 7 o'clock Saturday night, but be sure to find some time for K-State Online, whether it's on the social channels or on K-State Online with On3. A lot of great information and content to get you all the way up to game time and informed on the biggest question of the week right now is Avery Johnson or Will Howard going to start at quarterback on Saturday and everything else uh, with a lot of missing pieces on the floor for K-State that they're trying to pick up at this point in time. So that will do it for us. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Show.